Greg, if you start and we go to, uh, to the right hand and um, with a short introduction about yourself and what you do. I think microphone is over there. Thanks, thanks for having us. Um, so I'm uh, the Director of Finance and Enterprise Affairs at the OECD, uh, uh, yeah, basically the business angle of, at uh, OECD. And prior to this, I was the Chairman of the Australian Securities Investments Commission uh, for about a decade. And then prior to that, I was uh, on Wall Street as the Global Head of Securitization of Société Générale. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I was an investment banker for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know Dom and Thiel because she's at the security. And I was chairman of IOSCO, the International Securities uh, Organization. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Hi, so my name is Domiti Desertin. I'm the head of FinTech Innovation Competitiveness so at the French AMF, so the Securities Markets Authority. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Loretta Joseph. I'm the FinTech and Innovation Consultant to the Financial Services Commission of Mauritius. Um, before that, you know, I was a banker for many, many years, so uh, I ran IBS in India, and Greg and I are old, old friends, and we, we know a lot about blockchain. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Adam Jiwan. I'm chairman and CEO of Spring Labs, uh, where we're building the decentralized infrastructure to power the future of secure data exchange. Um, came to that uh, by virtue of having built a number of uh, scale online and specialty finance businesses in the US, Europe, and Brazil, and uh, excited to be here today. Very good. I think, Greg, I think we talked about over email about that. I think one of the expertise are the regulatory frameworks for uh, digital and crypto assets. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe you can describe where we are right now and where we are going, because I think this is a, it's a pretty um, you know, evolution over the last few years. And as I think the, the regulators are pretty active now in this space, uh, everything blockchain related, maybe, uh, maybe you can share your point of view, what's going on in that space. Sure. Uh, well, I, I think you could look at this from a number of different angles. Mm -hmm. And the, the broader angle, uh, you've got you know the, the general tokenization of assets and yeah. the, the regulatory framework for tokenization of assets more broadly. And uh, uh, we issued a discussion paper on this last week uh, at OECD, and it's available online. It talks about some of the regulatory issues. Mm -hmm. And I think on that, uh, I think at the moment, at the OECD, uh, we're, we're working on, uh, with an advisory board from, I guess, uh, uh, well, that's about 60 countries to develop principles of, of blockchain, uh, and which would then apply to something like that going forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At the next level uh, of um, regulation, I mean, you've got with um, uh, the uh, FATF guidelines on cryptocurrencies, uh, like they're been rolled out. I think they're fine-tuning those at the moment. So, you know, the virtual asset mm -hmm. guidelines. Uh, there's issues you can go to in more detail there. And then on the issue of Libra, uh, you know, where I sit on the Financial Stability yeah. Board's um, uh, working party, uh, we have a meeting next week in Singapore to look at uh, and our job is to develop guidance around uh, stable coins, or we probably need a word that's not stable coin because they're not that stable, uh, probably asset backed something. So there we're developing a, a regulatory framework that really would sort of deal with some of the issues that emerged from uh, global um, stable coins. Uh, so that's in progress and that'll probably go to the G20 leaders later in the year. Um, so that that's in progress. And then when you look at the issue of central bank digital currencies, uh, clearly, uh, you, know, the, you know, you saw the WEF last week issue yep. their toolkit um, on central bank digital currencies. OECD were also doing work around central bank digital currencies. And then, you know, the BIS have now set up their innovation hub and looking at. So I, on the CBDCs, I think, you know, you've got, again, emerging uh, things happening there. So there's a lot happening across this space. And I, I think we're going to see more clarity as the year progresses. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good topic. I think you mentioned the, the activity in the OECD. OECD. I think you, you saw the announcement of the Bank of International Settlement, mm -hmm. setting up a dedicated board member just for that topic, with mm -hmm. setting up innovation hubs, yeah. 
yeah. bringing the central banks together. Um, we saw the World Economic Forum also. So it's a, it, it is after the Libra push, a uh, hot yeah. topic uh, yeah. uh, to tackle. Is, is yeah. there something the, that you... I think the issue, mm. I think the issue that, uh, uh, like we, we started looking at this a couple of years ago and at OECD we brought together central banks and we had, you know, the Swedish came in and talked about what they were doing and, and Chinese came. So, and then even, you know, even five years ago, uh, when I co-chaired, you know, CPMI, OSCO, the central banks, right, they were, they've been looking at digital currencies for a number of years. But I think the thing that people didn't appreciate is that, they were, that the, the speed was so fast. And the thing that scared everyone with Facebook was the potential uh, take-up. That you know, normally regulator you go, well, okay, if it's too small to care, you don't worry too much. But the the, the alarm bells on Facebook were that it, it could take off and be adopted, and you could have a real problem actually then trying to regulate it. So that it sort of I think spurred everyone onto action, and also highlighted one of the biggest problems is the speed and cost of international money transfers is unacceptable. And if you talk to central banks, that is the thing they will accept has been what uh, Libra has highlighted. Uh, Libra's marketing, which was about making it inclusive, is frankly a little bit uh, benign because they're still required to deal with anti-money laundering laws. And to deal with anti-money laundering laws, they said that they're going to rely on the banking system. It's a little bit sort of self So, so is, it, is it the, <laughs> the biggest right. concern, is it the compliance KYC AML uh, concern about Libra, or is it more that, you know, with the Libra basket, uh, you know, influencing the monetary authorities uh, of that, or is it, is think, it, is it uh, yeah. a the, different the, aspect? What's the, 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 big, the biggest issue yeah. from that perspective with li well, the, the, the two, it's a couple of key issues with Libra. One is the rate of take up, right? And if, if sudden, you know, with the number of people in Libra, being how big it is, it could be a problem once you unleash it. Mm -hmm. um, but secondly, it probably is going to be more likely to be attractive in um, countries which have uh, weak currencies, right? Where they go, well, you know, it's probably better than the alternate. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the, you become, you get then get a sovereignty issue as to who controls your money supply. Which, you know, uh, and then the other issue with Libra is that, you know, people, didn't, you, know, ha you know, what happens with lending in Libra, okay, and deposits in Libra, and then interest rates in Libra, and conversions in mm -hmm. Libra. And funnily enough, one of the biggest flaws in the Libra structure that I think is quite hilarious as a former, you know, structured finance banker um, is that you, you actually give your money to Libra and you get back the coin. But actually, if you want to, if you want to get, your, if you want to change it back, you must. You can only go through secondary market yeah. sellers. And my point to them is, well, what happens if there's no liquidity? Yeah. Yeah. Now, somebody said, oh, well, perhaps you could make it a present. Okay, well, that probably doesn't really work. So um, I, I think there were some structural oh, okay. flaws in Libra. So I think that's been. But what has Libra has done um, has crystallised, I think focus on the fundamental issue, which I do think there's a need to, I mean, the cost of transferring money internationally should be zero, and it should be instantly. And I think that's now, that's going it's to be, yeah. I think, the big change. Love to hear your view on um, uh, what's going in from, from, a, from your point of view, from a market authority perspective uh, in the French market. Nobody. Sure. Actually, a lot is going on uh, in France because we've been working quite intensively on the topics of digital assets over the past few years. So I would say that uh, perhaps a key milestone has been uh, reached um, late last year, actually, because we've had uh, new frameworks that have been uh, put into place. So they stem from a new law that was called the PACT Bill, which was adopted last year in May. And basically, it grants the AMF, so the Securities Markets Authority, a new competence for uh, both ICOs, so the operation of uh, issuance of tokens on blockchain, mm -hmm. and for uh, any types of providers of services on blockchain, so be they trading platforms, custodians, um, um, fiat to crypto exchanges, or um, portfolio managers, um, advisors in crypto, and so on and so forth. 
So I think this is actually um, uh, an important step for the regulator because it's a new area of uh, competence. Uh, what is important to note about these frameworks is that they encompass everything that is not financial securities, and we consider by that uh, all the digital currencies, so the Bitcoin, Ether, so on and so forth, to us do not fall within the, the, the category of securities. So there's been a lot of discussions between regulators about as to whether they should be captured by uh, existing securities regulations or no. And we decided in France to come up with new regimes. What is important as well is that um, they are comprehensive, as I was uh, um, mentioning, they cover uh, a, a broad scope of activities and they really aim to cover the whole ecosystem that is uh, developing in that area. And I think uh, one interesting point as well is that they are to a large extent optional, which is something quite new for regulators as well. Um, so there is, um, I would say, a core uh, part of the, of the regimes that, it, that are, is not optional and it's the part on AML, because obviously this is uh, something on which uh, we cannot be uh, optional. Um, but then we have some sort of uh, labels that can be granted by the regulators. And this was to take into account the fact that it's very difficult uh, in that environment, blockchain environment, to determine the, the nationality of the businesses. So it's really uh, more in um, an attractive spirit to say, if you want to be regulated, if you want to abide by the rules because you see an interest in your business, you can come to France and get one. So that was an important milestone. All these regimes are now operational since uh, late last year. And so we are starting to receive some, uh, some application files. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a very good news to us. Very good, thank you. Loretta, what's your... I think there's a microphone for you over there. We're just sharing. <laughs> <laughs> this is the decentralised... Uh, panel. Um, so I started to look at digital assets um, back with Greg in 2015. And the, the issue is I think we need to understand that blockchain is the underlying technology. And the first application of this technology was a cryptocurrency. Bitcoin was the first ever application which um, makes regulations difficult because if we go back to the internet, and um, does everyone know who Robert Kahn is? Okay, he wrote the IP, the Internet Protocol, and the Transmission Control Protocol. He sent a message across an open network to a man called BitSurf, saying hello. Now, we can't regulate the technology, um, but I think as Greg pointed out, the first use cases we saw were in cryptocurrency. So we as regulators and people got very scared because um, Crypto, and when you put currency into anything, you scare the living daylights out of central banks and, um, and, in, in, and regulators. So I think um, I first went into the Australian government back in 2016. Now, the problem was that the finance ministry, the regulator, the, the minister of um, technology and the prime minister's office all had a different definition about a digital asset. So some called it a crypto asset, some called it a virtual asset. Um, my argument was that it's not virtual because it exists. So all we've seen, and I think um, with cryptocurrencies, was the birth of a new asset class. Now, I've traded many asset classes. I was a trader for many years. Um, it's just another asset class. But we need regulation around that asset, that, that asset class, that we, we can't regulate technology. This is the important thing is that we need to be able to regulate the activities and the services around um, the providers of that. So obviously the first use case was cryptocurrency. Um, the underlying technology has many use cases across every vertical, whether you're in health records, health sovereign ID. Um, it's all it is, it's a fancy word for a, 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 um, a database. But this is the first database that we've seen in history that isn't controlled by somebody. It's not centralised. Do you all have Excel spreadsheets? Yeah, and you'll have passwords. So that's the difference with this technology. It's a decentralised database that is immutable, transparent and secure. So if anybody tells you anything about a cryptocurrency, I would tell you here, the only thing I think that the cryptocurrencies have done, they added a security protocol layer onto the internet. That is the key thing of the, of the blockchain technology. And of course, we're seeing new, um, new variances of assets develop. And as Greg mentioned, the tokenization is the key thing in this, because now we can tokenize every asset class. So cryptocurrencies was, the token, it was um, a digital form of money, but we can now have a kilowatt hour of energy, um, a health record, a, an ID. So that brings many challenges in for us as regulators, because um, in regulators and securities, 
we do investor and consumer protection. So it was the easy start, but I think um, you're seeing frameworks now around the world, policies come, standardisation, countries starting to recognise that digital assets exist and it's just another asset class. Mm -hmm. Adam, uh, looking from your business point of view, so all the compliance requirements, AML requirements, what's, the, what's your take on uh, those requirements? <clears throat> so if you're referring to the new FAFSA regulation, I mean, I think that's something that could really sort of, you know, impact liquidity because there probably was a lot of illicit use of cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, in the context of, of my business, it's actually a, a very different use case, right? So whatever your sort of position is on the need for extra governmental currencies, you can have a view. For us, we are people uh, who are developing technology based on blockchain to enable financial institutions and others to actually mm -hmm. be able to do compliance, customer onboarding, and AML yep. in a much better way. Uh, and frankly, there are ways to use blockchain in conjunction with advanced crypt uh, cryptography to actually do so in a way where it actually uh, maintains consumer privacy. Mm -hmm. no, it's good to, good to know. I think uh, one of the biggest changes I think upcoming also coming out of the G20 and the FRTF, which is the Financial Action Task Force, is the so-called um, uh, travel policies. Um, uh, maybe, Numati uh, and Greg, maybe you can explain what are the, these are for the, the, the crypto environment, a huge change. Uh, tighten the AML and KYC requirements of, uh, for fund transfer between uh, exchanges, etc. Maybe you can explain, first of all, um, uh, about the background or the, the content and also what, what, what's the implication. Numati, maybe you start and Greg, you comment on that. Maybe you do this in a different order. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, that's right. Absolutely. So the FATF adopted yeah. new uh, recommendations that's that okay, sorry. last uh, last June, I believe, uh, if I'm correct, or last May. I'm not so sure. Um, and some of them, um, yeah, one of them, the, the recommendation 16, I believe, is the travel rule, so which is um, particularly challenging to to um, implement in the crypto asset environment. So of course, AML uh, is a key challenge for the for the digital asset environment. I, I would say it's one of the three. You have the cybersecurity challenge, the AML challenge, and the data protection challenge. And uh, the, the, this environment, the digital asset environment, needs to really uh, manage to find a solution for these three challenges to really become mainstream. So this is, will be a key area uh, going forward, that's for sure. Um, so in Europe, we have already um, some rules for AMLs that um, stems from the fifth directive on AML, which, was, which entered into force early this year, in January. Mm -hmm. So there's already, I would say, some uh, a core set of rules that is common to all European countries. But then now we need to uh, assess how we can implement the FATF uh, recommendations uh, within Europe. So at this stage, there are only recommendations. It means they are not binding. Yeah. Uh, so FATF um, uh, only provides some recommendations. So we now need to discuss with uh, or other European colleagues to see how to put them into force um, within mm -hmm. Europe. But it's important, we think, uh, that these uh, AML framework for digital assets really takes into account the specificities of this environment and that we do not try to copy paste what exists in the traditional system because the, 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 this new system, mm -hmm. uh, digital assets, there may be some, uh, some uh, specificities that needs to be taken into account. Yeah, I think I think the um, the AML D5 um, uh, directive is important because I can see this already with certain crypto exchanges that they put limits in in place uh, that you only can transfer in and out certain amount of of money. If you hit that threshold, you have provide have to provide much more information. So, so it's much more rigor uh, uh, than previously. Is that is that a fair summary? Yeah, yeah, it is it, indeed. And the difficulty of this is um, that it needs to be applied at the international level because yeah. most of the largest players are located... Uh, China. Yeah, well, outside Europe, let's say. And it's very difficult for European players to uh, comply with this rule if um, not the whole ecosystem applies it. So it will definitely be a challenge. Mm -hmm. Greg, love to hear your insights. Look, uh, I... Uh I couldn't really add too much to what Domantil said. You know, I mean, I think that FATF uh, has done a good job in quickly 
bringing something forward on, on the issue of digital assets. Uh, I was talking to the head of FATF yesterday. I think that, um, and this issue about, they've tried to, with this requirement, in terms of size, they've tried to make it proportional, so that once you go above a certain level, you've got to do more, which sort of, at mm -hmm. least it's got some sort of proportionality to it. But also, I think, you know, I think FATF are open to sort of seeing, you know, for some reason, it, it, there are things that are not practical. I think there's a flexibility there to fine tune what's requirement. So I, what I'd say is that industry needs to, uh, you know, put their case where they feel there's a, 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 a credible case for why something doesn't work. Uh, and I, I think that that's probably the most important thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, I agree with Domitel. I mean, the, the G20 leaders are very concerned about uh, AML uh, and, uh, you know, they've quickly responded to develop this framework. It's a framework, I think, that can be discussed where it's not, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, the priority is to detect and enforce where, you know, money, you know, either terrorism financing or illegal money laundering is occurring. That, that's the fun. But, but uh, my understanding is still time to influence that policy, that travel policy from a, because what I see in Switzerland, uh, all the exchanges and now the digital asset bench, they have formed a, a so-called virtual asset service provider group, mm. VISSP, to uh, uh, get up to speed, plus also to influence that. Yeah. Is it is still time to, I, to do that? Or? I, yeah. I, mind you, always, yeah. these things, regulators are much less... Uh, you know, if people put cases forward, why why something yeah. is is, but you you know, having sat on both sides of the fence here as a regulator, but yeah. also as an industry industry lobbyist, I think the, the the problem sometimes for industry lobbyists they only see it from their perspective, and if you're going to successfully lobby, you've actually got to think well what 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 is the regulator trying to achieve? Mm -hmm and try to reconcile what you're trying to do. And I think the ones that are successful are those that recognise that, you know, clearly what FAT is trying to do is deal with the problem, you know, in terms of stopping, you know, and being able to trace yep. laundering. And I think that, that, you know, so if you're trying to influence it, that's what you've got to do. Yep. You can't go and say, oh, this is not fair. This doesn't, and this doesn't work for my business. Because if you do that, you go, it's tough, <laughs> you know. So I think that's a bit of a, a learning, okay. which maybe that's what they're okay. uh, they're doing. Laura, I'd love to hear your view on from a from a Maurice's point of view. Uh, uh, how, how big is the impact, and what what do you see? So I'll just go back to the travel rules. So the travel rules when, means when um, we have bank accounts. So when we move money across the world, money. So it comes down to what do you think of money being. Um, the beneficial owner of that money movement and the, the, the person that gets the money have to be required by law to make sure that they've um, gone through a number of checks with the bank. So we all have bank accounts. And I think um, the Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies get a very bad, bad rap because if I say to you, um, cryptocurrencies, the first thing that people say to me, it's used to launder money and to finance terrorists. If we actually look at the technology, and as I said, it's a fancy word for a database, we can, that, that, that database is transparent, secure, and immutable. We can now track right back to the start of that data, the movement of, say, a, a cryptocurrency. Um, by law and definition in the countries I've worked, it gets very complicated because I think we're talking about a commodity. So we're, we're not actually talking about money per se or money movement, but do I have the ability to transfer to you my Bitcoin? Um, with, and we can do that now without a third party. So the, the, we take out, we disintermediate markets. Um, most of the people in the ecosystem don't want to do anything bad. They're not nefarious players. They're not trying, you know, they don't want to fund terrorism, all the bad things. Um, but they're just building technology. And they don't understand, as one well, I've had with the FATF, is that you take in a bunch of kids that are building technology, this is way above their head. Um, so we need to work together to be able to use, say the technology actually solves the biggest problems of money laundering and terrorism financing, because unlike cash, I can trace it right back to source. 
I argue with this all the time that I can go and stand you know, on a border between two countries, move a lot of cash, and no one ever sees it. But if I did that with the cryptocurrency, guess what? It's an immutable, transparent record, and it, so it actually solves the problems. But I think the big problem has been that technologists are not policymakers, and policymakers are not technologists. So innovation is happening. We, we're struggling to keep up as regulators what this innovation is. You know, this is a technology blockchain that's only 11 years old. And I've seen, you know, in the last five years when I've walked into central banks and, and you know, heads of state, they go, it didn't matter. But all of a sudden the technology and is becoming so fast and so changing that we can't just impose rules like a wire transfer because in this ecosystem, it doesn't work. So I think um, you know, it, it's very good to have the, these discussions. The FATF are really on the right track because they're involving the industry, and the industry wants to help. So you talk about the virtual asset service providers. The industry are now working on a, on a solution that solves that very problem. So they're actually helping the FATF solve the travel rule. Um, as I said, policy and regulation are evolving. We're all new at this. If we all do it in silos, though, it doesn't work. So we, you know, I think as policymakers, regulators and industry have to work from the same side because the internet taught us all that a walled garden approach doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Adam, going back to um, helping the compliance EML KYC2 from a technical perspective to make it smooth and, and, and more automated. So what kind of breakthroughs are, are you expecting or how can the technology help us to make it more seamless? Now, because I, you know, this kind of requirements, uh, especially cross-border, will not go away. The question is more you know, how can technology can help us to make it more a better sure. experience at the end. No? So uh, if you think about customer onboarding, KYC yeah. or AML, there are perhaps two meaningful ways in which, uh, for instance, blockchain could be additive. So as Loretta mentioned, a decentralized sort of database creates an immutable authoritative record. So if you think about AML for a moment, if you can create immutable authoritative records of beneficial ownership, of uh, source of income, source of earnings, source of uh, funds effectively, that is very, very important, very, very helpful to actually identify uh, suspicious activities, for instance. So regulators could use it for that purpose, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, blockchain, again, in conjunction with other types of technologies, can be used for information sharing. So for instance, in many cases, financial institutions now need to report or know who beneficially owns a company, for instance, right? And in the US, for instance, there's discussion about having uh, owners of companies actually report the same information to FinCEN. But that information on its own is quite useless because you can't actually verify it. However, again, if you use blockchain in conjunction with other sort of privacy-preserving technologies, you can all of a sudden connect self-certifications with what, let's say, an owner of a company has reported to Bank of America or JP Morgan or a series of different institutions or different types of institutions to identify, again, inconsistencies or matching, again, to identify suspicious activities. And then from a more sort of humdrum, uh, uh, ordinary business uh, perspective, uh, blockchain absolutely can be used for efficiency and greater accuracy within customer onboarding. So for instance, uh, if you think about identity sort of verification as it's done today, it's typically done on a point-to-point -point basis. So a person goes to apply for a financial product to JP Morgan, JP Morgan first needs to establish whether that person is who they are purporting to be. And the way they do that is they typically go to single points of truth. They'll go to a credit bureau, they'll go to a news store, a payphone, a LexisNexis, again, to verify individual identity fields, like a phone number, an address, an IP address, something along those lines. And those single points of truth can be compromised. And the most pernicious, rapidly form, uh, growing forms of fraud, like synthetic identity fraud, um, really sort of take advantage of the fact that a lot of identity verification is done on a point-by-point -point basis. So again, a decentralized approach or a multi-party attestation approach to identity verification can create much greater sort of accuracy mm -hmm. and point out inconsistencies to help financial institutions, uh, again, identify and root up certain types of fraud. Mm -hmm. So before we um, ask the audience for, for questions, Quick statement from you all, you know, what can we expect? What's your outlook uh, in, in respect to uh, the AML KYC uh, compliance topic, um, especially in the digital asset uh, crypto space? Love to hear your statement, Craig. Um, maybe you start first on 
what do you think? What will happen this year, next year? Um, just to get an insight, you know, everybody's working on certain topics, but I think what, what will, what kind of changes uh, can we expect? I, I think it's a, a work in progress, and I think we're in an implementation yeah. phase, and some things will work, prove to work that, that's in there, and others may need to be adapted. Quick statement on digital currency on the government. It is a, a topic for, you know, do we see first state own uh, digital currency this year, or what's your, what's based on your discussion that you're having? Is there something that, you know, it's still a few years out there, or do you think it can accelerate if some, you know, like China maybe will start? Well, China's been working on it for about five years. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, uh, but these things move much slower than we know. Uh, we were talking a bit earlier, you know, there's lots of people with proofs of concept yeah. and pilots. Just to give you an example, mm -hmm. the Australian Stock Exchange uh, is the clearing and settlement, as you know, is going on to uh, blockchain. Uh, they started in 2015 um, and, you know, it, it's, a, it's two million accounts, you know, scalable, right? But they don't expect to go live until 2021, right? So six years since uh, they started. So I think, um, you know, China is well progressed. Will they launch? Some, I, I think within the next two years, I think we will see something. I'm not sure it's this year, but uh, this year, but I, I may be wrong. But uh, you know, it's it, that probably the, the uh, in the area of digital currencies, probably the thing that you'll probably see first is in the wholesale market wholesale rather market, than yeah. the mm -hmm. retail market. Retail market, yeah. Which is, yeah. you know, it's already been trialled in wholesale, Singapore, Canada. Singapore, yeah, it's actually, you know, MS. So mm -hmm. wholesale is a lot, obviously, easier than retail. So I think it probably you see the first, uh, well, you've already seen some trials. So probably maybe the first developments will be wholesale rather than retail, okay. I think. But, you know, look, I, it's moving, you know, moving quite fast at the moment. So, Good. yeah. What's your outlook? No, I fully agree with Greg. Um, and I think, as, as I was saying, that the, this AML challenge is really key and essential if we want to see uh, the uptake of blockchain technologies within the security space, um, which to me is really the, the, um, the next step uh, for, for this year. We've already seen some projects. There are some, some pilots, but now um, I think we are getting closer to the phase of production. So it will take some time before, of course, uh, we have something live and that works, but clearly the, the fact of having a blockchain used in securities transactions, probably in the wholesale uh, space uh, at first, with both the securities leg and the payment leg on chain, yeah. is really... Uh, That's a big game changer, I, no? Yeah. Maybe you. Not until hit. I mean, you know, the problem with the World Bank bond issue... It, it was it, it worked in terms of securities, but the missing was the payment leg. So I think it'd be nice to see somebody do it with a payment leg, and and it wouldn't surprise me. World yeah. Bank tries to do it, so yeah. it'd be good to see. But we're going to get breakthroughs. It, okay, it, it's continuing. Loretta. So I, so I guess it's also a bit of a it's a problematic for me too when you look at blockchain. So when do you actually need a blockchain? So so blockchain it takes out the need it disintermediates markets because it takes out the need for a trusted third party. So we talk about this this network as trustless. Um, that brings in a few challenges of its own. But um, but when do you need a blockchain? If you and I, if, you know, if we trust each other, Adam and I trust each other, I don't need a blockchain because I know that he's trustworthy and it's a transaction between me, him and me. But um, if, we do, if I don't trust him and there's more than two parties, there's a, there's, a, there's a reason to have a blockchain. So when do you need a blockchain? When you have competitors and collaborators in a network that need to share data but don't trust each other. Data is very toxic, so decentralising um, points of vulnerability as we've seen with databases, that's very hard. So this technology actually mm -hmm. takes out the need um, for people to hack, because people hack things when there's an economic and social benefit. If little bits of information are useless, um, the, the decentralisation is important. But one thing I think is, having worked for banks and you know, for a number of years, processes and procedures of back offices, whether it be a bank or a government, have been very onerous, very manual, for many years. So you're seeing the internet, um, AI, blockchain, they're not going to stand on their own. All these technologies are now starting to emerge mm -hmm. to give us the ability to make efficient, transparent, 
or real-time transactions, and we don't need to trust each other to do that. So that, that's what do I think. I, I spend a lot of time in the ecosystem. I don't believe that the libertarian um, anti-government view of totally decentralising everything like Bitcoin works, but I don't think the centralised world of after we've seen the GFC works either. So there has to be some um, meat in the middle. I think you will see this year institutions um, and the ecosystem coming together to be able to scale things, like to scale this into institutional grade um, needs. And I think um, you will see some of the biggest companies as we did back in 2001, the Googles and the Facebook emerge out of this next technology transformation. And I think that happens in the next year. Very good. Adam, final statement. So I, I think Loretta put that incredibly eloquently. The only thing that I would add to that is that um, there were a lot of companies that were formed or projects that raised a tremendous amount of capital that were very sort of technology forward. Uh, there were a lot of libertarians, a lot of folks who were really innovating for innovation's sake, but without actually developing solutions to address real business problems. And I think you're going to see significant failure of many of those projects uh, this year and next year and the years ahead. And you will see a handful of companies uh, and projects, frankly, do very well that actually go into real life production uh, and start to scale. Very good. So before we close, uh, do we have any questions out here in the audience in respect to the topic? No question? Yeah. Okay, as always, uh, we have one question in the... Uh... Yes, just a question about, you are speaking about massive use of blockchain. But what about the scalability? We know that blockchain uses huge amount of, uh, of CPU, huge amount of data, and huge amount of CPU time. So we cannot afford to have several seconds every time we are computing a transaction if we are speaking about massive use of blockchain. So that's a great question, actually. So latency, energy intensivity of sort of blockchain has been something that people have spoken a lot about because in mining, for instance, as it relates to Bitcoin, that has been a major, major issue. Uh, again, it depends really on sort of the use case. So for instance, within our company where we are onboarding you know, upwards of 50 large financial institutions uh, over the course of the next year and change, uh, our SLAs, our service level agreements, are such that we're able to render sort of you know, information exchanges among multiple parties as fast or faster than bureaus or consistent with payment networks. So again, I think it depends on the use case. Uh, and I think it, it, that, that really is what sort of determines sort of both latency issues as well as energy intensivity. Okay. I get asked, I love this question. Um, so I think, there, as we talked about, there needs to be a trade-off between having a totally public distributed ledger, like Bitcoin, where all of us in the whole world can use it, um, or having what we call a private blockchain, where there's only a certain number of people that are ac access that network. Um, but I think the, the thing is to, um, that the, the smaller the networks become, the less secure they become. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the thing about the Bitcoin network, it's so cyber resilient because it's so decentralised. Now, that doesn't work in a lot of use cases that we have, you know, for banks, for government. There's a lot of things that don't work, and the Bitcoin um, do, does use a lot of energy. So we talk about, you know, the computers that mine the Bitcoin. I argue that the Bitcoin network is in itself is securing one asset. So it's like having a tricycle put in the bottom of the Federal Reserve with all the, the depth and the width um, of new assets that we can now build on top of that. So that's where the technology comes in. I think the Bitcoin network solved the security and the scalability doesn't come from a public network. I think that doesn't make sense, but you are seeing now institutions and you know, banding together where the networks will be smaller, but it's a trade-off. So they're gonna be less secure but they, yeah, they're going to use less energy and they're going to be done for, for specific purposes. Okay. The most developed place in the world on blockchain is China. Then they're way ahead of everyone else and they're all permission ledgers. Yeah. They're all permission. They're not using electricity like Bitcoin. That's where the future is. Mm. It's in permission ledgers. Okay. 
Um, thank you so much for all your insight and, and uh, you know, this topic will continue. I think this is uh, very clear and having, uh, you know, the panel here talking from a different angle perspective, thank you so much for sharing all the information and uh, I think this topic will continue and uh, please give them a really big round of applause. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you so much.